Welcome to the Waterloo Willington Children's Groundwater Festival. Well, welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for day three of the Waterloo Wellington Children's Groundwater Festival. Now, even though we are together from a distance, we are so glad that you were able to join us today. And for the next 60 minutes, we're going to have a lot of information to share with you. Now, today's event is being recorded and registered attendees will receive an email with the link in the coming days. But first, we'd like to start things by inviting Michael to share the land acknowledgement. Sir, if you would. Thanks, Kevin, and good morning. And good morning to all of you. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge and recognize that the water and the land that we'll be talking about in Wellington and Waterloo is the traditional home of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people. For thousands of years before European settlers came, these indigenous groups took care of the water and took care of the land and made sure that all living things had a safe place to live and thrive. Now these groups, the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe people, they're not gone. They're still here. And they hold traditional knowledge that can help us make sure that our environment is safe for years to come. I encourage all of you to ask questions and learn about indigeneity. Working together is always the best way forward. Now, let's begin. Back to you, Kevin. Well, thanks so much, Michael. Much appreciated. Now, do you have any questions about water? Well, some of our friends have had their questions answered. Let's listen in. We ask them some water-related questions. If you could be a water animal, which one would you be? I would choose to be a beaver. A beaver is one of Canada's national symbols. Beavers are incredibly industrious and hardworking, so there's always something to do, and they build amazing dams, and they live in families, and to me, family is very important. If I could be a water animal, I'd definitely be a beaver. I love the idea of having a house with an underwater front door. That would be really cool. And right away, my favorite is a dolphin. I think dolphins are amazing and very smart, and um, yeah, love seeing the school of dolphin fish when they're going through the water together is pretty awesome. Why do you care about water? I care about water because 98% uh, of our brains are water and without water we would die. So water, we need it to be sustainable, we need it to live and thrive, to think and to help care for our planet. So water is incredibly important to all living things plants, animals, and humans. Uh, why do I care about water? Uh, because, you know, you need it to live. <laughs> That's why I care about water. Um, and, um, you know, I think we, we, we just have an obligation. It's just the ethical and moral thing to, uh, to, to be a part of, to protect uh, that resource. Well, today we're talking about habitats and communities. We're going to learn about watersheds, wetlands, the Great Lakes, invasive species, and species at risk. And if you have any questions, make sure you just pop it into the chat. And we have a team of water experts standing by to answer your questions. When using the chat, though, remember it's important that we're respectful and only share questions and comments about groundwater, and what we're learning today. And I have friends in the chat room, and if necessary, they can remove comments or actually even put you in a timeout. But I know that's not going to be necessary now, is it? Because I can count on you to be respectful. Also, we're using slow mode today. Now, that means information typed into the chat will be just slightly delayed. So please be patient with us when we're answering your questions. But now, let's get started with a talk about watersheds. Hello, 
My name is Kayana and this is my dad, Peter. Today we will be talking to you about watersheds and the water cycle. What are watersheds? Well, the name can be misleading. Misleading because a watershed is not a shed to store water, but an area of land where precipitation is drained to one point. Basically, a watershed is land that drains rainwater into rivers and streams, which then continue to drain into larger bodies of water until they reach a common point. Watersheds include towns, cities, forest, agricultural plains, and floodplains. Watersheds can also be called drainage basins or catchments. They are important because the flow and quality of water are affected by the land they drain through. Watersheds are also a key component to the water cycle. Condensation occurs to gaseous water particles in the air, which then precipitate and fall to earth as rain. Watersheds then drain this water into rivers and streams, which then drain into lakes, bays, seas, and even oceans. There the water evaporates and the cycle starts again. To provide a visual of how a watershed works, we have a demonstration that you would normally get to experiment with if we were not in a pandemic. And this is how it works. The funnels each represent different parts of the watershed system. The top represents nature. The second represents a creek. This one is a river. This one is a lake. And this is the ocean as most lakes water eventually drains into it. Let's pretend that uh, we just had a lot of snow in the winter I'm going to plug this top funnel and if I release it, it's going to symbolize uh, a spring melt of the snow and as the water goes through the watershed. You can see it goes really quickly through the watershed. Yeah, but in real life there would be other factors that regulate the water's flow. One of these natural factors is a wetland. These usually border bodies of water. Wetlands act like sponges. Their vegetation soaks up excess water and slowly releases it. Let's put a couple wetlands in our watershed. Let's see how this works now. As you can see, it's more regulated and slow. So the wetland is absorbing the water. <laughs> in addition to regulating water flow, Wetlands are incredibly important to wildlife biodiversity. They provide habitat for all types of species, including amphibians, birds, fish, and plants. And for these reasons, wetlands should be protected. We also have human intervention to manage water flow. One way we do this is by using dams. I think we first got the dam idea from beavers. <laughs> Uh, beavers are incredibly adept at using mud and sticks to create barriers to stop or restrict water flow. Anyway, these stoppers are going to represent man-made dams. They let through some of the water, but not all of it, so they regulate the water's flow. Let's put this in our watershed and then see how it affects it. So another rain event happening here. You can see that the wetlands and the dam in particular is is managing the water going through. Dams and wetlands work together to regulate the water's flow. Now, speaking of water management, we have a great example of this beside us now. This is the Woolwich Reservoir on the Grand River watershed. Reservoirs are created to store water and most are created by dams, as this one was. Now are we, we are at the bottom or the lower side of the dam where you can see some water is being released, just like the stopper. Before the dam and resulting reservoir were here, there was, is, a river called the Canigajig River. You can see that below the dam, this river continues in its more natural state. The river will flow down the watershed, eventually draining into the Grand River, which drains into Lake Erie and finally the ocean. A real life example of the important natural system called the watershed. Thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed. Bye! 
Well, thanks very much, Peter and Kiana. Funnels are a really good way to explain what a watershed is, aren't they? Now, let's watch how water moves through a watershed with the help of a high-tech sandbox. Hello, everyone. Uh, I wanted to share this map with you. And it, but before we do that, I wanted you to think about what a map is. So if you think about what a map is, it's a picture from up in the air looking down on the ground. On the map, to represent different things, uh, they have to use colors. So for water, they use blue. Uh, sometimes forests are green. Now, buildings are squares. Uh, roads could be lines with different colors. But how do they represent hills on a map? Because that's really hard to do. So I'm gonna zoom you in a little bit on this map and you'll notice there are some lines on the map. So if you look very carefully, you're going to see some lines. Those lines each represent an elevation above sea level. If the lines, and they're called contour lines, if the lines are close together, then that represents a hill. These lines are far apart, so this is a flat area. So let's make a hill. Here we go. Watch what happens when I make a hill. Boop you can see how the lines are now close together. Now you'll also notice some water has appeared. So what's happened is I've dug down close enough to the ground, underground, and I've hit water. So that happens in real life. So let's cover that up. We're gonna make the watershed, the Grand River watershed, and that watershed is a main river and all of its tributaries. So in Ontario, Southern Ontario, here are a bunch of watersheds. So there's, there we go. So let's build the Grand River watershed. Uh, so the Grand River starts up near a place called Dundalk, and it's about as wide as your desk at school and it travels downhill. So here's the Grand River. That's the main river in our area of the world. It goes through a bunch of towns. It goes through Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge, Paris, Brantford, Caledonia, Dunville, and it makes its way to one of the Great Lakes. It makes its way to Lake Erie. So let's make Lake Erie. Here we go. And there we go. You can see the water flowing downhill here to Lake Erie. All right, that's awesome. Now, there are some tributaries that flow into uh, the Great, the Grand River. So if you live in Guelph, we have the Speed River. So there it is, right there. If you live in Paris, we have the Nith River. It's a very windy river. And it joins up with the Grand in Paris. And there's a bunch of other rivers that join up. So we're going to, there's the Grand. Now, how does the water get in the Grand River? Gets in from these other rivers, but also gets in from the sky. And so, uh, when it rains, that water, uh, when it rains in our area of the world, that water ends up in the Grand River. So I can get some rain going. There we go. So you can see it going into the Speed River and it's flowing into the Grand River, right there near Cambridge. And same with the Nith, so we can get some water. It eventually flows into the Grand River just near Paris, so you can see that. Now occasionally, uh, especially in the springtime, when it uh, rains and we get a lot of snow melting, we get extra water. So sometimes we actually get flooding. So here's the extra water, see what happens. Just notice where all the water goes. Some of it flows down the hills into the Great Lakes. Some of it flows uh, across the land and some of it gets stuck on the land. So you can see the low areas 
that's where um, the water gets stuck and so that's one way we get extra water. The other way the water gets in the river is there's water underground. If you dig down far enough, uh, you can hit water. And so sometimes that water percolates up to the surface. It's called springs and it goes into the river that way. So you can see that happening. Sometimes we, uh, in the, especially in the summertime, we sometimes don't get very much rain. And so we get droughts. And so we get very little water flowing which isn't very good, especially if you're a creature that lives in the water. Um, so one of the things the Conservation Authority does is we have some dams upstream of Lake Erie. Uh, on, on the Speed River, we have a dam. Here's my dam. I'm gonna make one. I'm gonna put it right about there. So there's Guelph, and here's Guelph Lake right behind it. So behind the dam, there's a reservoir. If you're from Guelph, you'll, rem you'll recognize that. Uh, there's a dam on, this, on the Grand River uh, called Bellwood, and there's a dam on the Conestoga River called the Conestoga Dam. So they all do the same thing. In the spring, if we get extra water, uh, those dams hold the water back, so you can see behind the dam here, uh, and then that water is slowly released out into the river system over the summer so that there's always water in the river. So you can see the Guelph Lake here, there's still water and it's flowing into the Grand. This is really important, especially if you live way down here in Brantford, because Brantford gets all of their water out of the Grand River. Now let's see what happens when we get extra water again. One more time, here we go, that's a drought. There we go, we'll see where the water goes. You can see it all flowing downhill. Some of it gets trapped on the land. Some of it soaks through the soil. And some of it runs into the river. So that is the Grand River Watershed. Thanks, we'll see you guys later. Oh, well, that was really interesting, watching how water flowed through the sand. Now, do you know what watershed you live in? Well, Sue is going to show us with the help of a map. So, over to you, Sue. So already this morning, we've learned all about what a watershed is, and it's an area that collects all the rainfall and then takes it together and then it outlets to one place. So think of the watershed like a bathtub, where you've got the shower is the rainwater, and then it all slopes down in the bathtub and then collects down in that drain. So this includes all the farms and hills and valleys and cities and roads and ditches, all going to one place. So where we live in the city of Guelph or the region of Waterloo or the county of Wellington, we are in the Grand River watershed. So even though our local creeks and rivers could have different names like the Conestogo River or Irvine Creek, all of these same smaller creeks and rivers, they end up going to the Grand River. And this whole watershed is 6,800 kilometers squared. That's about the size of Prince Edward Island, our smallest province in Canada. So we're gonna take a few minutes and we're gonna use a map to figure out how the rain falls in our watershed. This is a map that's available through the Grand River Conservation Authority website. And perhaps if you've got this printed off through your teacher already, you can grab a pen and a marker and you can draw on this map, or you can just follow along with me for the video. So it's probably weird to see a map that has this shape on it. It's super squiggly and doesn't have a lot of straight lines. And maybe you've seen a map of Canada or you've seen a map of your own town, but probably not one that looks like this. But like other maps you see, it's got a title on it, which tells you what the name of the map is. It's got a legend on it, which tells you about what the symbols on the map means. It's got a compass rose on it that tells you which direction is north. And it's got a scale on it to show you how far apart the various things on the map are from each other. So this map shows all the major rivers and it shows the minor rivers as well. So the large and small rivers in the Grand River watershed. If you take a look at it, you'll notice that it's got rivers shaped like a hand on it. There's five different major rivers on there. So there's the Grand River in the middle of the watershed. There's the Speed and Aramasa rivers coming to the, from the east through Guelph. 
There's the Conestoga River that comes from the west and the Nith River as well that ends up meeting the Grand River in Paris. There are also lots of other rivers and creeks in our watershed too. So now we're going to take a look at the map. The watershed or source of the river is where the river starts. Where do you think on this map the river would start? If you said it was at the top of the map or where the river is the smallest, you're right. So this is actually a fun fact is that this top area in Ontario is called the Headwaters and there are a lot of other major rivers that start up here too. So the Credit River that flows to Lake Ontario or the Natosauga River that flows to Georgian Bay or the Saugeen River that flows to Lake Huron. Now, while water flows down from higher elevation to lower elevation or from a higher spot to a lower spot, it doesn't always mean that water flows to the bottom or to the south of the map. That's just how it works out in this watershed. So rivers in Northern Ontario flow to, flow to James Bay and rivers in Northern Canada flow to the Arctic Ocean. So can you figure out where your town or city is on this map? It's gonna be different for all of us. So if you're home or school or in the country, let's pick a town that's maybe close to where you live. The largest cities and towns on the map, they're identified in pink, so that's showing where the developed area is. In our watershed, the biggest towns and cities are Waterloo, Kitchener, Cambridge, Guelph. And then in the county of Wellington, we've got other smaller towns like Rockwood, Alor and Fergus, Arthur, and Drayton. And in Waterloo region, we've got Elmira, and St. Jacobs, and St. Clemens, and Heidelberg, St. Agatha, and Baden. When you found your city or your nearest town, let's draw a little circle there with your marker. And this is gonna be your starting point to figure out where the water flows. Now let's find the nearest stream or creek to that circle marker. So for our system, the water flows southward or down on your piece of paper. So with your marker, I want you to take that and follow that river all the way down. Eventually the water from the Grand River goes to a great lake. What great lake do you think that would be? If you need a hint, it starts with the letter E. It's our smallest great lake. If you said Lake Erie, you're right. But Lake Erie isn't the end. Do you know what happens to our water after it goes from Lake Erie? It goes over a big set of falls and then it goes through Lake Ontario before ending up in the Atlantic Ocean. You're right, you got it. So what we do here in our watershed can really impact what the water's like in the lake, in Lake Ontario by Toronto and all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. So this is a, a big example of our map of the watershed. And we've got tubes on here to show how some of the water will flow. So if you're starting up in Arthur and you started to throw a stick into the river up here, it would flow down the Conestoga River, going all the way through Waterloo and Kitchener where it meets up with the Grand River, down here through Brantford, all the way to Lake Erie. Similarly, maybe you go to school in Fergus or Alora. 
and you might be on the Grand River or you might be part of Irvine Creek. So if you threw a stick up here in the river, it would flow down the Irvine Creek, hit the Grand River, and then take the Grand River Express all the way down to Lake Erie. Because the system is all connected, you can really see that whatever you do impacts the system. So if you're over here in Guelph and you're enjoying a nice picnic in the park by the river, make sure you don't throw your garbage in the river here because it will end up floating down all the way to Lake Erie and then out into the Atlantic Ocean. So make sure you keep your litter in its place and make sure you keep the river clean. Well, thanks so much, Sue. Now, the next time you come across a river or a creek, look on a map to find out where it is. Now, wetlands are an important part of a watershed, but do you know why? Let's find out. Hi there! You've caught me going for a walk at the FWR Dixon Wilderness Area, which is south of Cambridge and we're standing in the middle of a wetland. Wetlands are some of the most diverse habitats. Wetlands are called wetlands because they're wet. Wetlands usually have water that's covering the soil for part of the year or for the whole time of the year. And wetlands can get their water from precipitation, from flooding, from meltwater, or even from the groundwater upswelling. Wetlands can change during the times of year because of the rainy season or because of flood and wetlands can sometimes even be dry. Wetlands can be lots of different shapes and sizes. Wetlands can even be found within a larger forest. What we're standing in right now is a swamp. And the swamp is dominated by trees. Trees that don't mind having wet feet or wet roots. These swamps can usually dry up over the summertime. Now we're gonna go check out another type of wetland. We've just walked down the trail and we're experiencing another type of wetland. And this is called a marsh. Marshes aren't dominated by tree species. They're dominated by herbaceous, non-woody species like grasses. There can be some shrubs in marshes too. Marshes usually appear along rivers and along lakes. And we have a really big marsh in the north of our watershed at Luther Marsh in Wellington North. Marshes are home to lots of different animals, amphibians, fish, birds, and aquatic mammals. What do you think made this kind of mark on this tree? Let's listen to some of the animals that we can hear in this marsh. I'm hearing lots of different kinds of animals here. The third type of wetland is a bog. Bogs are an acidic organic wetland. The soil in a bog is really rich in materials from the decomposition of plants. So rich in organic materials. And this is called peat. Bogs get their water source from precipitation. I'm standing in a fourth type of wetland. This wetland is called a fen. Fens get their water source from the ground, from the groundwater, and they are less acidic than bogs. In our area of southwestern Ontario, bogs and fens are more uncommon. It's much more common to find swamps and marshes. The reverse is true in northern Ontario. Not only are wetlands great for habitat for animals and also provide recreational opportunities for us, but they also perform a num number of other functions on the landscape. They filter nutrients, so they help to clean the water that's coming into wetlands. They're also able to absorb water when it's rainy or flooding, and then release it slowly when it's drier. By doing these functions, it really helps to lessen or mitigate the effects of climate change. Once upon a time, wetlands used to make up 27% of the Grand River watershed. Today, they make up only 10%. A lot of wetlands were lost during the European settlement in 1800s to make way for farming, for urban development. Some wetlands can be restored or recreated. Conservation authorities and Ducks Unlimited and a number of other agencies work to try and restore and recreate these kind of wetlands on the landscape. Where wetlands exist, it's really important to let them do their functions. 
to respect signage that says stay out, to make sure wetlands are kept clean, and to not disturb or remove any sort of vegetation around them. Where vegetation has been removed, it's really great to plant a buffer around the wetland to help it keep protected. The next time you go for a walk in the woods, make sure to check out your local wetland and see what kind of species you can find. Wetlands are so important, aren't they? Clean water, help prevent flooding, and provide a home to so many animals. Now, thinking back to the watersheds, we know that the Grand River drains into Lake Erie. But what about the other Great Lakes? Can you name them? Hello, my water festival friends. My name is Karina McDonald, and I work at the University of Waterloo's Earth Sciences Museum. We were just talking about watersheds and the Grand River watershed. Did you know that the Grand River watershed is just one of many watersheds that surround the Great Lakes? Yep, there's a lot of watersheds out there. And each one of those watersheds drains into one of the Great Lakes. Most of us have been to a lake before, chilling out on the lake shore, going swimming, canoeing, camping, fishing, you name it. Lakes are great recreational areas to relax around. But have you ever actually been to one of the Great Lakes? I'm talking Superior, Michigan, Huron, Erie, or Ontario. Wait, what are those names of the lakes again? I'm talking Superior, Michigan, Huron, Erie, or Ontario. I got it. These lakes are great for a reason. Number one, they're so big that you can't see the other side of a great lake. Nope, can't see it. Number two, they're so big that they hold one fifth of the world's fresh surface water. To put that in perspective, if all of these five cups were the world's fresh surface water, the Great Lakes would hold one entire cup. Is that yours? Number three, they're so big that almost 40 million people depend on them for drinking water and live around them in Canada and the USA. Wow, that's a lot of people. Number four, there are over 3,500 species that call the Great Lakes home. I think I got one. And number five, they're so big that they create their own weather patterns. Have you ever heard of the lake effect? That's when clouds pick up so much moisture from a lake that by the time the clouds get to the other side, they're so full of water that it rains or snows on the other side of the lake. Well, that's a little more precipitation than I was expecting. No wonder they're called great. Since we can't visit each of the Great Lakes with you today, we're going to go to a place where we can see all of the Great Lakes at the same time. Come on, let's go. Welcome to the Earth Sciences Museum at the University of Waterloo. Here at the museum, we are wild about all things nature, including water. And since the Great Lakes are such an enormous feature in Canada, we wanted to feature them in our atrium. This is our Great Lakes water fountain. The fountain shows the direction water flows through the Great Lakes in real life. As you can see, water flows from Lake Superior to Lake Huron in Michigan, down through Lake St. Clair, which is not a Great Lake, into Lake Erie, over the fabulous Niagara Falls, and into Lake Ontario. Once water flows through all the lakes, it eventually makes its way out the St. Lawrence River and into the Atlantic Ocean. The fountain also shows how wide and deep the lakes are when comparing one to another. As you can see here, Lake Superior is the largest and also the deepest of the five lakes. It is huge compared to Lake Ontario and very deep compared to shallow Lake Erie. Thanks for joining us, everyone. I hope you think the lakes are as great as I do. 
Well, that was some great information. Great? Get it? Yeah, we're here all week, folks. Well, a watershed is home to many different species. Sometimes we use words like uh, invasive species and species at risk. But what does all of that mean? So I decided to come over and take over this room. Then I'll have two rooms and tons of space for my stuffies. But this is my room. If you come over and take over this room, then where am I gonna sleep? How about the hallway? There's space there. The hallway is loud because there are people walking around. There is also no bed. How do you expect me to fall asleep there? Not my problem. Wait, are you stuffies multiplying? Yeah, I need room for all my babies. Mom! Oh, Clara, I was gonna eat those. And where did all the good food go? Did you eat it? There's food on the counter I didn't eat. The only food on the counter is peanut butter, which I hate, and dog food. You can still eat it. But it would make me sick! I was hungry. I have to feed my appetite. Since I took over your room, all the back and forth is wearing me out. You are a pest. No, you're an invasive species. How am I supposed to thrive in this house if you keep taking over everything? Invasive species are no joke. They are non-native organisms that cause a lot of damage when introduced to a new area. These species compete with native wildlife for resources and thrive at the expense of the local ecosystem. Garlic mustard, buckthorn, and phragmites are three examples of plants that spread really easily and quickly and take over areas from other native plants. Phragmites are a really big concern because they take over wetlands, outcompeting all the other plants and spreading quickly because there are 2,000 seeds in each head. Round goby are a type of fish that was accidentally brought over by Europe through ballast water. When ships move around cargo, they take on some water to help balance the boat when the load gets lighter. This is called ballast water. It can suck up fish, mussels, and lots of other organisms and move them around to places where they shouldn't go. There are new rules to treat ballast water to help stop these organisms from moving around. Back to the round goby. The round goby competes with native fish for food. They eat the young fish and eggs of other fish and they have lots of babies, meaning that they can take over an area super quick. The zebra and quagga mussels are other animals that have caused huge problems in the Great Lakes. They are filter feeders. You'd think that this is a good thing because they filter water so much that it becomes clearer. But the problem is that they filter out the plankton, which are little tiny organisms. These plankton are at the bottom of the food chain and feed mussels and fish, which in turn are food for other fish and aquatic mammals. By removing plankton, the zebra and quagga mussels disrupt the whole food chain. The best way to stop the spread of an invasive species is prevention. Clean boats to reduce the transfer of an invasive species. Don't release exotic pets into the wild. Plant gardens with native species. Don't use invasive species like the round goby as bait fish. It's so good to have my bed back to myself. Almost to myself. The Grand River watershed is home to hundreds of different species of fish, birds, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and invertebrates and plants. They rely on the river as a food source, habitat to live, breed, and raise their young, and as a path to migrate along. It is important that we protect this river and the environment around it to keep it clean so that wildlife can continue to live on this river now and in the future. Did you know there are 66 species at risk in the Grand River watershed? Some of them are red side dace, 
a fish with large eyes and a red stripe that jumps out of the water to catch flying bugs to eat. Jefferson salamander, a small brownish gray amphibian that lives under rocks and in burrows. It starts life as eggs in forest ponds, then eventually loses their gills when they become adults. Then there is the Blanding's turtle, a reptile with a yellow throat and chin, and a domed shell that lives in shallow water, usually in large wetlands, and the bald eagle, a large bird with a bright white head, neck and tail, and a dark brown body with a wingspan over two meters. They nest in large trees near major lakes and rivers where they can hunt for fish. But what are species at risk? Species at risk are animals that have special statuses given to them by the government in order to know how to protect them. In Ontario, animals that are at risk of survival can be listed as endangered, threatened, or species of concern. Endangered means the species lives in the wild in Ontario, but is facing imminent extinction or extirpation. Extinction means the dying out of a species, and extirpation is the local extinction of an organism or species, where they cease to exist in a particular area but continue to exist elsewhere. Threatened means the species lives in the wild in Ontario, is not endangered, but is likely to become endangered if steps are not taken to address factors threatening it. Special concern means the species lives in the wild in Ontario, is not endangered or threatened, but may become threatened or endangered due to a combination of biological characteristics and identified threats. So why are these species at risk? Oftentimes it is because of our actions. Human activities such as collecting wild plants and animals, removing them from the environment can cause them to be lost, hurt, or even die. Removing vegetation near forests, meadows, and water causes their habitat to become degraded and fragmented. Installing dams and culverts changes how water flows and may prevent migration of species upstream. Chemicals like pesticides, fertilizers, and household chemicals like paint thinners decrease the water quality. Urban and agricultural runoff increase litter, sediment, and nutrients in the water, decreasing the water quality. Take, for example, these three models. This is ground that has lots of undisturbed vegetation. This is ground that has had vegetation removed but has wood chips on top. And this is ground that has been removed of everything but soil. What happens when it rains? I add the same amount of water to each environment. Which one is the cleanest water? Which one is the dirtiest? Which one would animals prefer to live in or drink from? Redside dace are endangered due to habitat loss and degradation caused by urban and agricultural development. Increased sediment in the water makes it hard for them to see, while removal of vegetation near water reduces the amount of cover and food for the fish. Jefferson salamander also have endangered status because they need undisturbed deciduous forest floor and unpolluted breeding ponds that do not dry up in the summer. Blanding's turtles have threatened status because the loss and fragmentation of habitat, motor vehicles that run them over, and illegal collection for the pet trade. Bald eagles have special concern status because of pesticides that thin the shells of the eggs they lay, causing them to break and the continued development of shoreline habitat and pollution. Due to limited use of pesticides, we are now starting to see more and more bald eagles in the Grand River area and Ontario. So what can we do to help these species? We can protect these species by reporting when we see them, like on the iNaturalist app or website. We can not collect native plants and animals from the wild, being aware of important breeding and migration seasons, and avoid disturbing their habitats by sticking to trails when we walk in their natural habitats. We can also make sure we don't litter, dispose of electronics and hazard waste responsibly, reduce runoff from properties by using rain barrels and rain gardens, and organize neighborhood cleanup days. We can restore their habitats by planting trees and native plants, especially natural buffers around wetlands and other water bodies. 
The Grand River is a beautiful place where we need to balance human activity and respect the animals in their habitat. There's a lot we can do as individuals and as a community to help protect these species at risk. What will you do? From picking up litter to planting a tree, there are many, many ways we can help. You know, some days I wish I was a stickleback fish. Hey, Sean, do you have a song about that? Hey, are we still looking for milkweed? No, we're looking in the pond. Guys, I brought the ID sheet. Let's see what you caught. I think I got a stickleback. We need something to put it in. Where's the tray? I think Sean has it. Sean? Sean? Sean! Wish I was stick back fish, swim around the pond wherever I wish, give my tail a little swish. Wish I was stickleback fish. Wish I was a leopard frog, sit all day on a sunken log, start my life as a pollywog. I wish I was a leopard frog. Wish I was a dragonfly with a real long lip and great big eyes Water shoot out of my backside I wish I was a dragonfly Wish I was a painted turtle Walk around in my rainbow girdle For Oktoberfest I'd wear a dirndl Wish I was a painted turtle Wish I was a helper mine Bunch of little spines sticking out of my side Rolling a ball to protect my life I wish I was a hell of mine Wish I was a damsel fly nymph Nothing rhymes with damsel fly nymph La 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 Nothing rhymes with damsel fly nymph Wish I was a stickleback fish Swim around the pond wherever I wish Give my tail a little swish I wish I was a stickleback fish If I was a painted turtle, I would wear a dirndl? Eh, something to think about. Well, speaking of turtles, do you know if turtles can take off their shells or not? Our roving reporter, Mary Ann, goes to the source to find out. Hi, friends. I'm Mary Ann, and I'm here at the Lower Creek Nature Center. And I'm here to answer all your turtle questions. You guys have been writing me and drawing me pictures and asking me all kinds of things about turtles. Well, here we go. Uh, hopefully, this, is this thing on? <laughs> here we go. We're going to find out the answers to all your turtle questions. Right beside me here, I'm hoping you guys can see it, is actually a snapping turtle. They are sunning themselves in the beautiful sunshine today. And, uh, yeah, let's find out right, right from the turtle what you guys need to know. All right. So, first question is... <laughs> You guys have been asking me is, can turtles actually take off their shell? All right, let's find out. Really? Huh. Oh, my goodness. Okay, hang on. That, really? Okay, yeah. So, anyways, here we go. So, if you want to find the answer to that, I heard it right from a turtle. They cannot take off their shell. Their shell is actually a part of them. And uh, I, I just want to show you this. This is actually a turtle shell. The turtle who's no longer with us, but uh, my turtle friend explained this to me. They actually have a vertebrae, just like we have a vertebrae. They have a backbone, so their shell is actually a part of them. Uh, if you guys knew you had a backbone, go ahead from the top of your spine all the way, way to the bottom, feel your backbone too. So the answer is the shell actually grows with the turtle. Okay, yeah, cool. Awesome. <laughs> your next question is, uh, okay, what do you guys need to know? Okay, yeah, I'm just trying to remember from my sheets here. All right, you guys wanted to know if snapping turtles, that's what this one is right here, by the way. It's, uh, give me a thumbs up if you knew that. Can snapping turtles fit inside their shell? All right, let me, let me just find out from this turtle right here. Can you fit inside your shell? Huh. Really? Oh, is that why? Huh. All right, we got it. We got it right from the turtle here. 
so, uh, this turtle wants me to show the shell again because it's busy sunning itself. But if you look, the bottom of their shell is actually too small. That's the plasteron down there. It's also a pointer here. Um, and the plasteron is too small for them to fit inside. So the answer is they cannot fit inside their shell. All right. Another question you guys have been asking me is, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if I want to ask, but I'm going to do it for you. All right. So, uh, so my friends know that on land, uh, you're breathing with your lungs, correct? Yeah, correct. Okay. So breathing with lungs right now. But you know what? Okay, wait, hang on. I know this is embarrassing, but just, just give me a minute. Just give me a minute. Uh, they want to know. Hang on. So when you're underwater, let's say November, December, January, February, March, um, maybe even April this year, how are you breathing underwater? Okay, I know. You're just trying to show us something. Okay. Is Olaf correct? Okay, hang on here. Hang on here. <laughs> Sorry, this mic is not tasty. All right. The answer is, oh, my goodness. <laughs> I would have known. Are you guys ready for this? The answer is, Olaf is correct. They can actually breathe through their cloaca. So under their tail is this special body part called a cloaca. And they can uh, lay eggs through their cloaca. They can go to the bathroom through their cloaca. And they can actually take dissolved oxygen from the water. And uh, it goes into their cloaca. And that's how they survive the winter when they're hibernating. All right. Uh, were there any other questions? Oh, yeah, you guys wanted to know, are you a herbivore, an omnivore, or a carnivore? All right, let's find out from the turtle. Really? Not at all? Huh. All right, so uh, my turtle friend just told me that she is not picky at all. She'll eat whatever she possibly can. So I wonder if that's both plants and meat. Let me just confirm. Is that both plants and meat? Yeah, both plants and meat. So she'll eat both plants and meat. So I wonder, what do we call that if they eat both plants and meat? Yeah, I'm going to leave the turtle doesn't know. But do you guys know? Okay, uh, if you're thinking omnivore, you're exactly right. Turtles are an omnivore. Uh, they'll eat whatever they can catch, <laughs> whether it be plants, whether it be fish, whether it be something dead at the bottom of the pond. Um, they'll eat it for sure. Okay, cool. That's great to know. All right, what else did we want to know? Okay, it's kind of another touchy subject. I don't know if you can ask someone their age, but you always say, like, how old are you, right? That's always our favorite question, besides what color, what's your favorite color. Um, anyway, so how old is this turtle? Well, I'm not going to put her on the spot, um, but let's figure this out. How long can turtles live until? Um, this kind of blew my mind. Um, if I Google it, the Internet's going to say, like, 100, right? So they can live to be 100. But I met some friends in Algonquin Park who are researching a turtle named Henry. Um, I don't know if you know Henry from Algonquin. No, you don't know Henry. All right, so, and Henry, they, they've been researching him and catching and releasing Henry since the 1970s. I out with some fancy math statistics that Henry was uh, about 230 years old. If a turtle um, has everything they need to survive, Food, water, shelter, warmth, um, air, of course, all those important things. They can live a long life, um, but it all has to come from their, their habitat, their wetland, their pond, their lake, their river. Um, yeah, so anyways, um, I, I'm going to ask this turtle a really touchy question, though. So last question here. Um, what do you think is the biggest threat uh, to the turtle population right now? I know they're, they're species at risk. They're threatened. They're endangered. All eight of Ontario turtles are in trouble. Can you tell me, um, is it still habitat loss, or do you have another opinion? All right, let's hear from the turtle. Oh, really? Oh, I don't know if you guys knew this, but my turtle friend is saying roads. Roads are the biggest threat to them right now. Trying to make it across the road or make it to a place uh, to lay, lay their eggs is, is the biggest problem right now. Um, if a female who's going to lay her eggs get hit by a car, it's devastating for the population. Uh, yeah, so, anyways, I'm really sorry to hear that. Uh, yeah, I'll tell, okay, no worries. I'll, yeah, hang on, hang on. Yeah, yeah, I got it, I got it. Okay, so she wants to, to remind you guys, watch out for turtles on the road. Slow down, especially in the springtime when the mother turtles are trying to cross the road. And then in the fall when the baby turtles hatch from their eggs. All right, those are all your questions. Well, all most of your questions, anyways, that you guys have been asking me. All right, well, I'll we'll, we'll say goodbye uh, to this special turtle here. So I should let sun themselves a little bit longer. All right, thank you so much, Snappy. It was great, great to meet you. Well, thanks, Snappy, for taking the time to talk with Mary Ann. Much appreciated. And thank you 
for joining us today at the Waterloo Wellington Children's Groundwater Festival. And a reminder, today's event was recorded and a link will be emailed to all registered attendees. And if you can join us, join us again tomorrow at 10 a.m. to learn all about water systems. And we're going to end our time together today with a song from Sean. But first, I want to tell you about a Kahoot quiz you can play that covers what we learned today. Details are included in the chat, so make sure you try it out. And now, for that song I promised you, it's all about what to do when it's raining. So, bye for now. Well, the weatherman said you better stay in bed. It's another gray, rainy day. Everyone to spare, there's water in the air. It's gonna wash your smiles away. All the plans you made will have to be delayed because of this H2O. Everyone hide, you have to stay inside, there's nowhere you can go. Cause it's raining, it's pouring, puddles are forming. It's raining, it's pouring, go do something boring. Well, the stuff we need to live is falling from the sky. No time to celebrate, hang your heads and cry. Farmers might say that showers are a blessing, but we've been told the rain should be depressing. So shut down all the playgrounds, close the summer camps. Imagine what would happen if the children got damp. Hide out in your houses, hide out in your cars. If you want to find some water, go look for it on Mars. Because parents all know, and you should not forget, the worst thing that can happen is if something gets wet. It's raining, it's pouring, puddles are forming. It's raining, it's pouring, go do something boring. Well, the weatherman said you better stay in bed. It's raining, it's pouring, puddles are forming. It's raining, it's pouring, go do something boring. It's raining.